talking about, he didn't know anything about Julia. And it's very hard to find personal facts about Julia Lathrop. She was a very uh, timid person. She was not a person that uh, talked about herself at all. She talked about her work, but she was, she was quiet, she was timid, uh, she was uh, hardworking. And probably uh, between the three women, to me she's really uh, more the kind of person that I'm like than the other two people. And uh, that's probably not going to tell you a thing about me. But, <laughs> but she, she lived in my hometown. And the last 20 years I've been the tour guide for the Convention Visitors Bureau in my hometown. I was born and raised in Rockford. Julia was born and raised in Rockford. I, uh, Jack and I were talking, coming over here tonight, that a couple of nights uh, we went to uh, Mendelssohn parties at Julia's the house that Julia and her sister lived in on National Avenue, which is still in Rockford, not near the river, not too far from the Rock River on the west side in the north end of Rockford. And a lot of the streets that uh, Julia must have walked on, the places that she went, I know very, very well. And so it becomes a, when it's my town, and it was her town, becomes a very personal story to me. And so trying to find out about Julia was a very interesting, uh, it was good that Jim put the, uh, with this idea to me to try and find out more about uh, Julia Lathrop and her family. And so I will tell you about Julia. Uh, Julia, one theory was justice, not pity. She believed very much in finding justice but she didn't feel sorry for her. And in the beginning, uh, she, talked, she talked a lot in the beginning about her family and where they came from. Uh, she said, concerning her ancestry, her ancestor, Reverend John Lothra, L-O-T-H-R-O-P-P, -P. it was spelled differently in those days, would have come over on the Mayflower, but unfortunate circumstance found him in jail. <laughs> Where, when the ship sailed, he had joined a non-conformist religious group that met in London. Lothrop and two-thirds of his congregation were arrested. He appealed directly to the king for a petition for liberty or exile. It was more than 10 years when he accepted an invitation to pastor in New Plymouth and left England. So um, oftentimes people have said that Julia looked Italian. She had a dark, dark complexion. And when she wasn't smiling, she had uh, eyes that much like mine, looks sad. She looks sad, very sad. And she, uh, her father, had come from New England and uh, and had come west to join a sister uh, who lived in the Rockford area. And he wanted to be a lawyer. He had studied law out in the east and had gone further uh, into Illinois, which was pretty rugged at that time, and got his, got his law degree and came back to Rockford and he met uh, Julia's mother. She was from a prominent family in Rockford and they had settled there some years before, had been one of the founders of Rockford. I think I will move my hat so I'm not having to move around and have that, watching that. So he married 
uh, Julia's mother, and Julia's mother had graduated from Rockford Female Seminary when it was a seminary. And of course, Julia was eventually going to go there when, after she started school. Uh, William was Julia's father. Uh, he came from New York and settled in Rockford. And he said Rockford in 1855 was described as the most beautiful town in northern Illinois. And some of the things that were happening at that time was a water power district in 1851. 1852, a railroad came through. And in 1860, a Mr. Manning had a reaper contest with the McCormick people and won. And Rockford became a very big factory town. Well, Adeline Potter, which was the name of, of Julia's mother, uh, had graduated in 19, 1854, the first class of Rockford Female Cemetery. She was a well-educated, attractive young woman who would become active in the suffrage movement. William and Adeline had five children. Julia was the eldest. Julia was an interesting young woman. She came from a, a father who was a Republican, a friend of Abraham Lincoln, who had a very thriving law office, and he was elected to the legislature of Illinois, close personal friend of Abraham Lincoln. My mother was socially prominent and was a lady who adhered to the code of conduct expected of a lady of that day. But she was a suffragette, nevertheless, and well-educated. My first memories of problems about in immigrants came through some experiences when I saw, in my early life, Swedish immigrants coming into Rockford. I really had a wonderful family life. We were very close in our family. We attended we attended church, the second congregational church. I should say my mother and the children attended church. Father came with us because mother felt it was necessary for him to come with the family. Although there were times when father and my brothers didn't always attend because there were other things they needed to do. I uh, had wonderful memories of my childhood. I attended public school in Rockford, and I was a good scholar, but I was timid and shy. I enjoyed acting in and directing plays, and I loved to continue, uh, and I continued that when I went to Rockford Female Seminary. And now, there were some discrepancies in some of the research about the Rockford Female Seminary. Some said two years. Some said one year to Rockford. I think the important thing about Rockford Female Seminary was that in that one year, Julia met Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Star. Then I went on to Vassar because I hoped for a law career. The general thought for women of the time was to marry and have children. I wanted a career. I went to work in my father's law office because I was educated in the law. But in those days, a woman could not be a lawyer in Illinois. I might mention, though, that in my father's law office, Alta Hewitt also studied law, and she was the first woman to get a law degree in Illinois. So I worked in my father's office as his assistant. I suppose now you call it a paralegal. I learned policies and procedures required by law. And I did some pro bono work, or paid work sometimes, 
for businesses that were starting up in Rockford. And what I did at that time, I invested in some of those of my own money that I had earned working in my father's office, which would help me later on in my life. So I had some finances of my own. I, I had heard them comment about how I didn't photograph very well. I was always described as wearing fashionable clothes, but my facial features all made, also made me look rather mournful. One writer even said that my facial expression looked rather Italian, and I, of course, was not Italian. All, I would, all of my life, I have been interested in people's difficulties. My father and I had heard that Jane Adams and Ellen Gates Starr were going to be coming to Rockford College, Rockford Female Seminary now became Rockford College, and they would be talking of a new project that they'd be coming involved in. And they were also doing fundraising. Well, they talked about the settlement house. And I was very, very excited to hear about it. So, in the winter of 1889, I joined them at Hope House. I was 32 in 1890. Uh, and I became quite involved in their activities there. Well, it was interesting because I asked Jane, what exactly could I do? I, I hear I was at an age that most women were married and had children. I didn't know what I would be qualified to do at, at Hull House. And she suggested, why not some, start some sort of class or some kind of a teaching uh, vehicle? And so I organized uh, the Plato Club. I had the classics uh, at college and out east, and so I had started the Plato Club. It was largely composed of elderly men, and it was a discussion group, and it had a variety of subjects. And we were in a very poverty-stricken area of tenement dollars. My club was very popular. Well, I became very active and useful in other difficulties. I seemed to be very good at intervention and difficulties between capital and labor uh, arose, which was a good thing because I had been in a law office with my father and I had learned the difficulties of manufacturers, but I also understood the problems that the workers had also. So it was natural that at Hull House, I would be the conciliatory voice that would influence people, particularly as they were involved in strikes. I became an early member of the World's Trade Union League. I was involved in many organizations essential to the development of sound democracy. Now, one of the things that I was most interested in doing was getting involved in the charities of Chicago and of Illinois. I was very concerned that many of the people that worked in houses for the mentally ill or old people or children's home were generally political appointees. Can you just imagine people getting jobs because of political appointees? Hard to imagine. So I got very involved in visiting the Cook County Charities. As a matter of fact, I visited all of the charities. I went one by one all through to look over the abuses that were occurring in the various institutions. I was concerned that young children were placed in institutions with adults. Mentally ill people and young children, seven years of age. So, one of the cases, Florence Kelly, who was a, a co-worker with me, uh, 
institutions. It was a rather, she talked about it quite a bit afterwards. I said it really wasn't as much as she felt it was, but she said she was going to use that same approach now, from now on, in the work that she was doing. All we did was we went to one of these institutions. I was coming to the, the gentleman that we talked to said I was inspecting his facility. I was simply coming in as a friendly visitor. Well, I really was expecting, but I was coming in as a friendly visitor to see how his institution was being run. And he was very hostile. He was not very anxious to show us through the building. But I talked with him a little bit about all the positives that I could think of that might help us to, to, to go smoothly through the building. And we did, and by the time we came back to his office and we sat down, he was a delightful man. He was so encouraged. He thought he really had done a very fine job. So I took out the list that I had written of all the infractions I felt that he was guilty of and his institution and the concern I had for him keeping his job and wondering if he wouldn't be willing to work on some of these problems. He was very, very anxious to work on the problems so that he wouldn't lose his job. Florence took the same model when she went then to some of the further uh, examinations that she went through. Uh, I was appointed by Governor Alkin Guild of Illinois as a member of the State Board of Charities. Uh, during that time on the board, I arranged competitive examinations for medical physicians in state hospitals. I often received threatening messages from political circles from the various institutions. I described the conditions in mental facilities with men and women in long corridors staring into space day after day. I described insufficient heating for people old and ill, poor food for growing children, and neglect for helpless, helplessly insane people. The attendants don't know how to take care of their charges, and so they yield to the temptation of roughness and cruelty. In 1901, I resigned from the State Board of Charities. I thought the public welfare service were services were being prostituted for political purposes. In 1905, I was restored and worked there for five more years. I always kept patronage positions at arm's length. I always advocated for merit system in public employment and humanitarianism. A big change from the political jobs that people were being given. And you can imagine how happy they were to see a woman coming in and telling them that they had to be on a merit system. I was elected president of the National Council of Social Work in 1917, and I helped establish the first juvenile courts and helped establish the first probation officer deputy inspector. And I might add that in the year 2015, many of those sort of same regulations are still in My work in 1921 in the Children's Bureau was granted federal aid for maternity and infant assistance program. I knew emotional pleas alone would not bring changes. I instead did careful investigations to make a case. And I had, during that time period, personally visited 102 shelters, facilities for mentally ill people, aged and children. And in one place, I was very concerned about the fires, fire escape. So I lifted up my skirts and I slid down a type of fire escape to make sure a dress could get by safely down the chute. They were shocked. I said, a person could die if their skirt caught. 
มันไปข้างหน้า I shared stories of the textile mills and the spindle of loom that boys and girls in shifts from 12 to 14 hours were submitted to. Between 1880 and 1890, the population of Chicago doubled and doubled again. Cheaply built tenements defined the lands landscape. Several families were often crammed into a single apartment. There was little sanitation, ventilation, or sunlight. Disease spread rapidly, infant deaths from cholera, tuberculosis, even simple diarrhea was common. I think I was able to interpret to the upper classes the needs of the poor and of the new immigrants. What is within my domain with what is within my power, what's in, within my gift, that could attack this and I will use it. Once once in a while, I would be asked to give talks about my life before I came to Hawaii. And I tried to explain to some of the folks, uh, some of the immigrant families that came uh, to Hull House for help and assistance, about how early Illinois was, how Rockford was in the beginning, how the immigrants came from Sweden, uh, in, in the 1850s and how badly they were treated and the other immigrants that came. I was, Illinois, I was in the Illinois Immigrant Protective League and I was a, found, a founder and trustee. Some of the young women immigrants coming from Ellis Island to Chicago to meet their <coughs> families were decoyed on the trains by men in the white slave trade. The League befriended newcomers and located their relatives and helped them adjust to their new life. I also spent time traveling to other countries to study their policies. Concerning these young immigrant girls, they came in thinking that they would be housekeepers or cooks in family homes and because they didn't understand the language, the white slavers would meet the trains, and they were soon working in the brothels in Chicago. We stopped much of that. President Taft named me to the post of chief of the Children's Bureau in 1912. I retired from that position in 1922. I witnessed official indifference to human need and developed a lasting conviction about the importance of competent and honest public officials. The thing that I brought to Hull House and to my friends there was that I, I took many notes and I did lots of, uh, lots of research on numbers and the numbers of people and how they were being treated and where they came from and what they were able to do and what they were doing. I was very tired of the indifference to the way people were being treated. As I said, I established the first juvenile court system. Prior to reform, children over the age of seven were imprisoned with adults. I wanted welfare to encourage probation rather than incarceration. In 1912, I went to Washington, D.C. as chief of the Federal Children's Bureau after having been at its Hull House for 22 years. I searched the world to find ways that other countries cared for people and how charities were more effective. I trained myself to be a researcher. There was discussion about prohibition. My feeling concerning prohibition, that no law should be considered passed by con Congress without an examination, either by medical or lay people. I 
disliked certain self-righteousness in the good citizen when he voted for laws which he himself had no intention of obeying. I wonder how many speakeasies during prohibition would have agreed with her. She believed women were better suited than men for work in welfare. In 1918, she, I was the second woman president of the National Conference of Social Work. I was very humbled by this. Even after retirement from public office, when I returned home to Rockford, I became involved in the League of Women Voters and voters on the National Committee of Mental Illness. I said the present time is one in which it requires unusual courage to be courageous. I was thinking as I read that about Julia Lathrop that today, in 2015, uh, that it takes unusual courage now to be courageous. In the last months of my life, I went to bat for a 17-year-old man, Russell McWilliams, who held up a passenger on a streetcar and shot and killed a motorman. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to be executed by electrocution December 1931. I went to his defense, and his sentence was changed to life in prison. That happened after Julia died. Hull House and elsewhere, Julia later kept on giving out strength to the weak, bringing light into darkened lives, leaving those who had erred back to safer and happier ways. Miss Lathrop made a career of kindness. This is a quote from Jane Adams. She continued even after she went back to Rockford as an activist in Rockford. My health was suffering and doctors found a goiter that needed to be removed. The day after the surgery, Julia Latham died April 15, 1932. In an obituary in the Rockford paper, it says of Julia Latham, it was immensely gratifying to Julia Lathrop's fellow townsmen that her transcendent ability had widespread recognition. Curiously enough, although she was a member of an old Republican family, it was a Democratic governor, John P. Elkill, who was the first to draw her into the service of the state. A Democrat president, Woodrow Wilson, refused to remove her from the post of Chief of the Federal Children's Bureau to which she had been appointed by President Taft. Miss Lathrop was vouchsafed a long life, but she lived in deeds, not years. A rare intellectual gift, she bore herself with the unpretentiousness that is so real in the truly accomplished. She had a happy wit, a gaiety of spirit, and her friends loved her greatly for her personal charms. She was born with the gift of human sympathy, which more than other, any other single quality gives approach to hearts and supports frail lives. By study and constant effort, she made herself well informed in the ways of health, especially for more considered care of the insane for the health and happiness of children, for the guidance and reform of youthful delinquents. At Hull House and elsewhere, unremittingly, <coughs> unobtrusively, and effectively, she kept on giving out strength to the weak, bringing light into dark, darkened lives, leading those who would err back to safer and happier ways. Miss Lathrop made a career of kindness. She is, um, she, the day after the surgery, she died on April 15, 1932, and she is buried near many of her relatives and her former Rockford College president, Anna Petzil, in Greenwood Cemetery in Rockford.
and she wouldn't take credit. It was very hard. Uh, she was like the low ranger. You know, she wanted to do the job and get out of the way so nobody knew she was there. But she did a lot of uh, statistics about things, a lot of research. And so she had numbers to back up what she needed to do. And she knew the law, which was really uh, such an asset to them uh, because that was part of the problem, you know, political appointees. And it was a man's world uh, for a woman. Uh, she had said herself that at the age of 32, she was well educated, but what would she do with it? And it was it was just a godsend that Jane and Ellen came to Rockford College and gave their talk about Hull House because she found her niche. And all of the things that she had had learned in her father's office and in school, she put it put it to work and, and she was the first woman uh, in in these positions. Because she was the kind of person she was, and she was she was not a pushy person, so she just sort of went in smoothly and was accepted very nicely. And one of the nice parts of it, she came from a very influential family. So with her father having been a state representative and in his age politics, very helpful. Uh, and she had her own finances. Uh, Ellen, if you remember last week, Ellen didn't have that family backing. When she when Julia came back to Rockford, she lived with a sister uh, on National Avenue until her death. And of the three, Julia was the first to die. How old was she? She was, well, 1858 to 1832. Very young, actually, seven years. Uh, but civil operation, and who knows, it might have been more serious than she really knew. And uh, two years, uh, two years uh, before I was born. So that now you're figuring me out. <laughs> On Friday, I will be 81. <laughs> yes, Friday will be my first time. Thank you. So did she have any brothers or sisters? Yes, she was the oldest of four, about five children. And she had they sisters. Have descendants of yes, yes, yes. Are they still I think, yeah, I think there are some relatives, aren't there? Yeah. The, I know the house that she lived in is being lived in by a, a, a gal that is a teacher at Rockford College, a music teacher, and her husband, who is a surgeon, uh, a surgeon, a pediatric surgeon, and they have one daughter. And beautiful home. And I hadn't realized when we went to the Mendelssohn party there that that was Julia Lathrop's home. And well, when, she, when I found out it was, I was, I was really looking around. I was, but it, it's a lovely home. It's a lovely area. Yes. Uh, it obviously took a lot of funds to operate the uh, whole house and then also a lot of funds to build all those buildings. Well, was they, she involved at all in acquiring I think, finances? I think she must have been, but she had money of her own, but then she also had work that paid well. You know, those those were pretty good jobs. Uh, but Jane Adams funded a lot of what went on in the beginning of Hull House, and they all did talks, and, and they had, uh, Ellen had taught school for very well-to-do students at her, at her school, and a lot of doctors and lawyers and socialites wanted to volunteer at Hull House and help finance it. Uh, so they had a lot of a lot of women that had this education and they didn't know what to do with were very supportive of these. And Julia was and Jane were one of five women that were the inner circle of Hull House. Florence Kelly was one, there were but there were five of them that were very close. Uh, Ellen Gates Starr was not particularly in that, that group. I think because of her religious, she was very involved in a religious, her religious faith in that journey. But Julia, uh, they, Jane wrote a really nice book. Uh, I think I mentioned it last week. Uh, my friend, Julia Lathrop, that uh, Jane talks about 
one foot and went door to door to door and to see how people lived and what they were doing uh, and what they ate and what, they, what work they did. And she was very involved in changing the laws to get them out of the factories and give them decent working. And she was involved in the unions. They all were very, they let the unions meet at all house, which probably didn't make lots of good friends other places. But uh, Jane was the one that did most of the talking for, for all of them, though. She was the, really the spokesperson. Well, do you know more about Julie now? Jim? Oh, that's, that's fine. Okay. Actually, I learned a lot from her. Yeah, well, uh, to find out personally much about her, other than people thought she was kind and gentle and quiet and unassuming. And uh, she dressed well. They said she dressed very stylish. She liked to dress stylish, like the ladies of the day. Okay, thank you very much.